it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Florian Pappenberger. Uh, Dr. Pappenberger is uh, head of uh, forecasts at the ECMWF, European Center for Medium Term Weather Forecasts. He uh, is an active uh, uh, researcher. He was responsible for the development and implementation of the operational center of the Copernicus Emergency Service, early warning systems and floods. He is the author of over 150 scientific publications, fellow of the Royal Geographical Society and the Royal Meteorological Society, and the member of several other uh, renowned professional uh, bodies. He is also on editorial board of several international uh, journals. So, Dr. Pappenbergen, thank you very much for finding time to lecture at our school. We really appreciate that. And uh, I give floor to you. So, 45 minutes lecture and 15 minutes for questions. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the extremely kind introduction, which always makes me blush. And also, thank you very much for actually having me. Um, I chose a fairly generic title for this presentation because I thought I'll introduce you to weather forecasting. And the reason I'll do this is because I'm originally a hydrologist and I had no clue what the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast actually is um, at the beginning of my career. It's a fairly well-known institution um, amongst meteorologists. It was created, as you can see from those pictures in the, in the mid seventies, um, when smoking in big rooms was still the, the norm. Um, and uh, you can see the signing of the convention of ESMWF here. It was created to pool resources among states who couldn't do computing on their own. So it was really trying to do weather forecasting, um, which is the most of doing the type of weather forecasting, which no country can do on its own together in trying to create a federation to do so. On this slide, you see our current member and cooperating states. Member and cooperating states um, span all across Europe from the eastern border of Turkey to northern Iceland. And our interpretation of Europe is a, is a bit more liberal. Um, we also have um, northern African states as well as Israel. In total, um, we have 34 member cooperating states with an increasing rate. Um, we are a very small organization, we have about 350 staff um, who come from about 30 countries all across the globe. And on top of that, we are collaborating with loads of institutions and agencies all across the globe. Our, our goal is very simple. What we do is really, really very targeted. All we want to do is produce the best weather forecast in the world. The best weather forecast in the world currently means that we produce something called a high resolution deterministic forecast. I'm going to come back later in my presentation to what that means, um, which we do twice a day at nine kilometers. We produce something called an ensemble forecast. And again, I will explain that later again, which we produce four times a day, a day with 51 times. And then we also produce a seasonal forecast with 50 um, also once, once a month. Um, what, what are the different terms mean on this slide? Medium range is usually defined between three and 15 days. So providing a forecast for the medium range means I provide a forecast for the next 15 days. Of course, um, I can't start day three, I have day one and two, there two naturally, but I'll focus on day three to 15. Seasonal forecast is um, six months, seven months, 13 months ahead. Um, and you have something else called, which was in my title, which is sub-seasonal forecast, which is one or two months in advance. Um, so these are the type of fundamental products we are producing and we're using for that on Earth system to forecast. What does this mean? What are the basic steps of trying to produce a forecast? At the beginning of everything, not just hydrology, but also meteorology, are observations. There's conventional observations, there's satellites, there's different types of satellites, um, which all feed to determine the initial state of the atmosphere to start modeling from. It's very similar to a catchment. It's very similar to a hydrological catchment. You know all the states in the catchment in order to predict the next state of the catchment. Of course, here I'm concentrating entirely about forecasts. I'm going to concentrate about the future. I want to predict the next steps. I want to predict not just simulate the past. I want to simulate what happens in the future. Um, the next step in NWP is quality control, which is something very normal. If you get observations from all over the globe, you have to do quality control. Um, 
Then we call something which is called data simulation, which quite a lot all of you will know. That is drawing to assimilate the data um, which we have and make them coherent with the Earth system modeling which we are modeling. So that's algorithms, background error discussions, observation error discussions, and increments. Um, from that, we produce a forecast. And the reason why there's an error is because data simulation forecasts um, are sort of intertwined with each other. You do data simulation by doing de facto um, type of short range forecast and going forward and back with your model. Um, but then you use the model out and there you have the atmospheric physics, you have the land surface and you have the oceans which you predict in the future. Last but not least, one of the more important components after you've done all this forecast, you're trying to disseminate it to users for their, for their, for their applications. Um, it has to be on time. You tend to post process a lot because people don't always like raw data. You need to do something about them and you generate products. And when you've done all that, you're actually not entirely ready because the other thing you need to do is make sure that your forecast actually is worth anything. So you have something called evaluation. Um, that's analyzing daily errors, that's looking at long-term statistics, that's looking at diagnosing more fundamental problems with the, the model or just looking at current issues. So these are the basic steps in numerical weather prediction. I'm not going to go through all these steps today. I'm just going to try to explain you some of the aspects which I feel are important. The first thing I actually want to start, because I'm going to go back to it later, is observations. Um, here I've showed you the type of observations ECMWF collects um, from ZUNOP, so that those are a type of observation type. You can see mainly, mainly land-based, but there's also some on ships. Um, you've got different colors for different types of observations, and we look in the left-hand plot. And these observations are shared by all nations of the globe with each other in order to do better weather forecasting. So they're not just used by the European Weather Center, they're also used by, by the Russian Met agencies as well as any other agency over the globe. Um, on top of that, you have on the right hand side a different type of observation, which are buoys. Um, and you can see some in there which are, which are sort of red. Those are the buoys which are static, they're, 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 um, they don't move. And then you've got the blue ones and the purple ones which are drifting around. So those are the type of observations, for example, we get from the surface from all over the globe. That's not all. We also get aircraft observations. Um, you may have seen in the news recently quite a lot about aircrafts and um, the impact on forecast quality. The reason why we worry about that is because a lot of our observations, and that's a picture which is well before COVID-19, um, and um, you just, we collect every flight which takes, or every flight which goes up, collects observations and sends those observations back to weather centers. Um, on the left-hand side, you see a picture which is taken, I need to look myself now, at 00 UTC. Um, if you look at six UTC, so six hours later, you can see slightly moving the planes um, to a different area. So you've got more dots, dots elsewhere, and it just basically moves with time zones. Wherever there's daylight, there tend to be more flights. Um, and also the east to west and west to east crossing of the Atlantic change slightly. Um, so we, we collect observations from aircraft. And one of the big impacts of COVID-19 was a reduction of aircraft and the reduction of aircraft lead, led to a reduction of observations. It did not lead to a reduction of forecast skill because we were very lucky that, that many other nations actually helped us in getting more data, which we didn't have before. And one of these more important data sources you see on the right-hand side is the radio sons. These are basically balloons which go up in the atmosphere and are, are sent up by the agencies all over the globe um, and collect those types of observations. And one thing which made the loss of aircraft data not so, not so significant for the forecast and for weather forecast was that some countries just allowed or started more radio sounds, got us more collections, more data, which fed back into our system. On top of that, we collect satellites, um, satellites from all over the world, um, from all, all different agencies. So that's, that's the Russian um, uh, the satellite agencies, as well as the Chinese, the Americans, and the, and the European agencies, the, the, the big ones. Um, and they all come in and we assimilate them in our forecasting system. The total number of assimilated observations around 40 to 60 million um, a day, which we get. And why is this important? Um, I thought I'll have to show you a picture why, why this actually matters. What I have here is uh, two tropical cyclones. The reason why I chose tropical cyclones is because in North Atlantic is because you may have heard that we have a very active season. This is now two pictures of 2018, um, so not of the recent one, but the current tropical cyclone um, activity is actually so active that we run out of names, which doesn't happen very often, and they have to use now the Greek alphabet. Um, on the left-hand side, um, on the top left, 
Um, you see a 10 day forecast of the storm Florence, um, which happened a while ago, so August 2018, um, which doesn't use any satellite observations. On the bottom, you see one which actually uses satellite observations. And I'm drawing your attention to the, to the small um, disturbance of tropical cyclone, which actually comes in from the east, so from the African coast. And if you look very carefully how it moves in, you can see that the simulation without satellite uh, without satellite um, observations actually doesn't represent fully how storm Florence evolves and moves. So if you wouldn't have any, any satellite observations, um, we would have had actually a very bad forecast. Um, you can see now how it appears at the top while it's still at the bottom. Even more significant, you can see that for our tropical cyclone Mount Cook, which happened um, in um, further east. Um, and you can see again on the top right hand side, you have to forecast without any satellites. You know, the thing stopped. Oops. And I don't know how to restart it, but hey, there you go. Um, and you would have seen that when you look at now the static picture in the top right without satellites, Mount Cook doesn't exist. Um, in the bottom, you actually have satellites and Mount Cook does actually exist. So satellites are extremely important, particularly over areas where we have very little observations, which tend to be sea areas. The, the aim of this slide is actually to show you what we do. Um, we absorb 600 million daily weather observations. Of those, we then process about 40 million of them to generate a virtual reality of our Earth system. This is the initial state. So we need this to actually understand what the initial state of the ocean is. Um, so, and why is it so important? It's quite simply because the initial state actually influences how the weather evolves. If you would have a logical model, you would have a very dry soil, you would have very different reaction to it as you would have a wet soil and you have a rainy event. Um, we all know that initial conditions matter. They matter even more in weather forecasting. And there's a famous paper, which, which um, is the birth of the birth of the chaos theory, which postulates that the, a flap of a seagull or a butterfly are was returned later and China influences the weather in the US. At ECMW, if we take this a step further, we do believe it's not just the weather that matters, um, which probably also explains why I'm talking so much about hydrology in this, in this lecture. It's actually entire land surface. What's really important is that we model the Earth system as such. The Earth system interacts with each other and you have lots of different directions here from the sun to the ocean to the land surface, and they all influence the weather, the weather in one way. So modeling just the atmosphere is not enough. And I'm gonna quickly omit that picture. One of the real difficulties um, of weather forecasting is um, that we actually don't know exactly the initial conditions. Um, it's very similar with the soil moisture. Do you really know the soil moisture at every single location of the catchment? Of course you don't, because you know what you would have to do. You would have to dig up the entire thing to actually fully understand it or use some remote sensing techniques. De facto, the atmosphere initial conditions are uncertain. They're slightly unknown. So we have several states of initial conditions, several versions of initial conditions, which create the beginning of a forecast. We are starting to run every single, we're running 52 models, we're running 52 models from those different types of initial conditions, which then create something which we call ensemble members, which are possible scenarios of the future, which then create something of different futures. Um, that's why very often weather forecast is uncertain. That's why you very often get probability distributions or uncertainty distributions with your forecast or likelihood of what happens. Um, I can show this even more visually in that sense. I'm just gonna show exactly the same point. Um, we don't know what the initial conditions is. We have different initial conditions. ESMW uses 52, it says 50 here because that's slightly how you generate them. Um, and those create 50 ensemble members, 50 states of the beginning of the atmosphere. We're taking those 50 ensemble members, we run them through a model. Um, we actually also have uncertainty in the, mo in the model two, which is not shown here. Um, and with that, we would use a forecast. We're producing 52 or 50 different types of forecasts. What this means is that you have forecasts which look like this. This is now a forecast, for example, for, the, uh, for Reading, where I'm currently based. Um, and you can see uncertainty propagating from the left where the forecast has been issued to the right um, um, where you have the timeline. At the bottom, you have the lead time. And I'm gonna show you this in an example, which is probably 
more close to home for you. I've chosen two locations here, Moscow and Novosibirsk. Um, I had a choice of about 12 different locations in Russia. I chose those two. And those are the type of forecasts we are producing. What you see on these plots is forecasts for cloud cover, total precipitation, wind speed and tumor temperature in that order. And what you have on there is probability distributions of that type of forecast. This forecast was issued this morning, so it's already a bit old. Um, but it basically says that, that the chance of, of precipitation for, for uh, Moscow is fairly low until Sunday, and then you have some probability. Um, you also have some wind speed there, and then you have a fairly narrow temperature band, meaning there's very little uncertainty. Um, slightly different in Novo Zabilsk, where you seem to have some rain. Well, this is forecast was taken a bit early, as I said. Um, all times here on UTC. Um, so you have already precipitation forecast, which probably hits you now. So if, you, if you're living in that area, look out of the window and see rain, then our forecast was roughly right. Um, just to show you that in more detail, that's a different station in Russia, <coughs> a bit further east. Um, what you have on this plot is the probability distribution. So you have the PDF, which is maximum, which is the 90 percentile, median, 70 percentile, 25 percentile, 10 percentile minimum. These are the box plots. And you've got something called Joel forecast and a high resolution forecast in there. Um, and that just evolves over time. What you have here is cloud cover, which moves between zero and eight. Um, so eight means um, cloudy, um, zero means um, nice blue skies or nice clear skies. Um, and you can see how it evolves. And we just go back to those plots. You can see that we have this for different variables in terms of forecast. And these are the type of forecasts which are given and presented um, to expert users. Um, so very often when you get a deterministic forecast on the radio or on the TV, they tend to be based on those type of forecasts and then the communication is slightly altered in order to ensure um, that people understand it. Um, so this is just, just going back to it, to this type of plot. So this is the end product. That's where you want to go to. Or some is really hard. Uncertainty is the most important bit in a forecasting chain. Um, and you can't do any forecasting without uncertainty. If anybody gives you a temperature forecast for more than a few hours or days in advance, you should just, just not believe them unless they give you a type of uncertainty around it. Um, uncertainty times are bigger and times are smaller. And that really depends on how the, how the weather situation is. Um, for example, if you now look on the left-hand gra left graph, at the bottom, where the two meter temperature is, as I mentioned before, the uncertainty bounds for Moscow are very small, um, indicating a fairly stable weather regime, indicating a fairly certain forecast um, for that area. And you can see a nice daily cycle between a um, little bit over, a little bit over nine degrees during nighttime, going up to 21-ish um, during daytime. This is the end. This is where we want to go. Um, and I'm going to now switch into a topic which I think is one of the neglected parts of, of research. Um, the research you're mainly very often looking at in universities tend to be research which um, is used in order to understand something, to improve something. And we use this research, for example, to improve our model. Um, but our single most important goal is to produce a reliable forecast of high quality. In order to prove a high, reliable forecast of high quality, we need to make research matter. We need to make sure that research moves to operations. We need to make sure that whatever you research, whatever you understand becomes something which can be executed on a daily basis without fail. Um, one of our real targets is that we never miss a forecast, that we never, that we are never having a problem of issuing a forecast, that a forecast is always there. So you can't actually always, you can always rely on something coming. And that's what we call research to operations. Research operations is a, is a fairly um, complex process, um, which involves a lot of planning. Um, there's a 10 year strategy, what do you want to improve? In ESMWF's case, for example, it's, it's, it's extreme weather. There's a five year strategy of what you can achieve in those five years. And then there's of course, individual research contributions, um, which are done on a, on, a, on a monthly, daily or yearly basis. Those different contributions get, get committed and combined and tested. And you must see this as a big, as a big system. It's a big system where loads of different researchers are trying to plug their code together. And you're just one small person in a big, in a big environment. You may be improving soil moisture processes. Somebody else will be working on the vegetation. Somebody else will be working on the vegetation coupling to the atmosphere. Somebody else will be working high up in the atmosphere and the stratosphere. Somebody else will be working on ocean waves. And all these things need to come together 
that need to be combined and tested in the end. Um, and that's what we call developments are combined and tested and accepted for merger. Because just because your improvement actually did lead or your small research did lead to an improvement, doesn't mean it leads to an improvement when you put it together. And the reason for that is because the Earth system interacts. So it could very well be that whatever you have done um, and improved your soil moisture may have had very bad effects on, 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 on vegetation or on the coupling. After testing evaluation comes operational testing. Um, so you put the stuff together, then you see that it actually works on the system. You see whether you can actually fit it on the system. You can see whether you can actually run it on time on the system. Um, and last but not least, you go to the end user. Um, and what we then call that is a cycle upgrade. Um, ESMWF does about one to two cycle upgrades a year. Um, and they take a long time. So just imagine you've done your little piece of research on soil moisture and it took you two years to do. You have two years, you worked very hard and found something which improves the soil moisture. Um, then you would have to merge into the other, merge into other contributions. Usually you have to merge it first with the people who do, for example, vegetation. That takes you about two to three months. Um, then you have to theme merge. That means you, you test stuff in a, big, in a bigger, in a bigger environment. So you put stuff more together. Um, maybe you don't just put it together with the vegetation, you also put it together with the atmosphere coupling. Then comes alpha testing, beta testing, and the entire process can actually last up to 10 months. So you've researched for two years and then still takes about 10 months to actually implement. Um, this is just now our first example. So we have different components here, which I got sort of put together and merged and you can different things here. Um, in ESMWF, as I said, we, then, we call each upgrade a cycle. And a cycle is a number, 43, 45, 46, 47. Forget what the R number stands for. There are smaller type of upgrades or different types of mergers um, in that way. And we just add more and more contribution. For example, our latest cycle, which is called 47 which was the one we just released, had contributions from over 400 different or 400 different types. That's probably nearly 400 different researchers who contributed something to this cycle. Um, and we need to see where that fits together. Um, I'm gonna jump this because it's boring. Um, and I said, it can take eight to 12 months to actually better and release test, test phase, test phase um, until you actually then manage to get out to the user and communicate all to the user, the process takes about up to one year in that sense. Um, one big element of that is actually communication. Um, and ESMW is extremely proud that we actually communicate all of our performances to the outside world very clearly. If you go to our websites, the ESMWF.int, um, you will see something called a scorecard. And a scorecard is what you see on the left-hand side. Um, in each column, you have, or, or each big, big block of column, unfortunately I can't show, maybe I can't. I don't know whether you can see my mouse, no you can't probably. Um, each of these split columns is, is, a, is a domain of the Earth. So we have the first three columns are the Northern Hemisphere, then the Southern Hemisphere, then Europe, um, the North America, and then South Asia. We've got many more of those. Each single line is a parameter. So in the top area, you have verification, it's done something called analysis. The bottom, you have verification and observations. Um, for example, down here, um, just the second from the, from the bottom, you've got something called total precipitation. Um, each single box is a forecast lead time. In this case, you show 15 lead, time, lead times. Um, you have three different types of forecast measures for performance or two measures of performance, one of, of, um, of a property. The first one is the root mean squared error. The second one is something called the continuous run probability score. And the third one is just measuring the spread of the ensemble, which is an important indicator. Um, and you have blue when it gets better, red when it gets worse, ignore the green and purple in that particular case. And you can quite clearly see that some of the parameters get better, there's blue throughout, um, and then sometimes get worse. If you're improving a forecast model of, of a dimension like this, there's always something which doesn't get better. And the important bit is to weigh up, is it, is it important that we didn't get better? Do we understand why it didn't get better? And is it systematic that we didn't get better? Um, and with that, we basically sort of trying to figure out whether you can implement and run a forecast or a new forecast upgrade, which you see here. 
Um, we use other tools too. We use something called in-depth diagnostic studies. They look at singular events and really trying to figure out and understand why it went right or wrong. Um, and then of course, we also have general user feedback um, where it's as simple as Twitter, where we check what do people say about the cycle. Um, you may say this is simplistic, but we're an agency of, of, of not many people. Um, the earth system is highly complex. There's no way to understand how a forecast actually improves. Um, there's one other element at ECMWF. Also, we have a lot of scientists. Um, we have a lot of people who contribute to a cycle. At the end of ECMWF, is one single person who makes a decision whether a cycle gets implemented. Um, and it's very hierarchical in that sense. I want to sort of already, sort of already alluded to actually looking at forecast scores. One of the important bits of improving a forecast is actually trying to understand whether you get better or not. Um, we use something called headline scores. So we don't look at just a single score. We look at loads of different scores. Actually, we look at over 70 scores if you, if you discount subsetting for regions. So we measure those 70 scores very often also different regions of the scores. So there's 70 scores for Europe. There will be 70 scores for Russia. There are 70 scores for North America. And all those have different types of information in them in trying to understand. In order to summarize that for our, for our governing body and for communication, we have something called headline scores and you can see them here on the, on the left-hand side. Um, those are the ones where we are measured against by our, by our funding parties. Um, the middle ones are probably more relevant to you. That's for example, a score for precipitation, a score for how well we do with your ensemble, a percentage of large errors, weekly mean temperature errors and many others. Just to show you one of those headline schools, I'm used here a normally correlation for the Northern Hemisphere for the extra tropics, so that's the region. Um, it's 500 hectare Pascal geopotential um, and it's when you reach or when that, when, when that anomaly correlation reach, reaches 85% on which day. Um, so the higher the number, the better. The red lines are the European Center, the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. The dark blue line is the UK Met Office. The light blue line is um, CMC, which is Canada. The pink line is Japan. The orange line, which you see towards the end, is the German Weather Service. The green line is America, it's called NCEP. And then KMA is Korea. Um, the other thing you see there's a static, as a dotted line. The dotted line is a static reference. Um, which is just a, a model which has been fixed at a certain time of the year. So you see a time series from 2002 to 2019. That model has been fixed around 2015 onwards um, and sort of provides a reference. Um, the first thing you can see the forecasts improve. Um, so we get up from 2002 to 2019, there is a sort of a steady line up. Of course, there's ups and downs. Um, some of the ups and downs are related to the to the predictability of the atmosphere. That's why I put in a static line here, for example. So the dotted line is the static forecasting system. And if you look, for example, around 2009, 2010, you can see the skill suddenly goes up um, because it's a static model and nothing has changed in this model. Um, you can assume it is because the atmosphere was more predictability. So it's not due to forecast improvements. Um, then it flattens out again. You can see in all the forecasts, they all replicate that sudden improvement. That's not because the forecast became better, so that's simply because it was easier to forecast. Um, and then you can slowly see how the red line basically goes up in ups and downs. Um, fairly simplistic, um, but you can also see that ESMWF does provide the best weather model in the world. Um, if you look at this line from 2002 to 2020, it's actually fairly remarkable. We came from something that we could predict a weather phenomena in a, in a certain certainty from day five, up to day 20, uh, day just six and a half, six, 6.2 in 2020. Very often this has been called the quiet revolution. Um, what does this mean? It means that the forecast, which was issued 10 years ago, if you would look at a forecast for day three, 10 years ago, today, the skill of that 10 years ago forecast would be the same on day four. So day four would be the same as day three, 10 years ago. Um, so we have improved dramatically over the years. Um, that is largely due to satellites. We have come a very, very long way. And we have come a long way, not just in, in actually, we have been able to go to the moon and you know, it was the anniversary of the moon landing last year. 
Um, I've got a drawing here because I couldn't find actually the actual picture of the Russian moon landing. Um, but it's very, it's very amazing we have come a long way. Um, in this picture, I wasn't actually very, I wasn't very interested in the moon landing itself. What me actually interested me was the, was the, um, the Earth, which you see depicted in the top right. And what you see um, there um, in the circle in the bottom left is actually a Russian satellite, very similar to the Blue Marble, a weather satellite. And you can see how crystal clear that image is of that, of that satellite. Um, but that's not all. Um, what you see here on the left-hand side is the blue marble from Apollo 17, taken in 1972. I took the, the Electro L number one Russian vessel satellite in the top right, just for your reference. And in the middle, you actually see the ECMW forecast. You don't see a satellite, you actually see a model simulation. And you can see how impressive detail that model simulation actually is. I'm not saying it's right, I'm not saying it's 100% overlapping, um, but we are actually simulating the Earth atmosphere to a very high degree. And if we go through history um, and look, for example, 1985, you can see on the left-hand side, we had a resolution of the model of roughly um, 200 kilometers. Um, you see what happened there. And you have the forecast of today in the middle, um, which is nine kilometers. And the right-hand side, again, I put a satellite just for comparison purposes, which is the meters are two. So now I had a Russian, American, and a European satellite. I think it was politically correct stretching across the globe. Um, you can see how well the forecast has actually improved. It is truly impressive what we've managed. Um, I've showed you before an improvement um, of the forecast for 850 hectopascal. Um, on the top left, top left corner, I'm going to show you now an improvement for different variables. Um, don't worry too much about what the y-axis is now. It's relative to a reanalysis. If you know what a reanalysis is, you know what I mean. If you don't know, it, don't worry. The higher, the better. Um, again, from 2010 to 2019, um, blue is for total cloud cover, um, green is for 10 meter wind speed, orange for two meter temperature, and then Z500, T850, and mean sea level pressure as well. Let's concentrate on the three surface variables, so two meter temperature, 10 meter wind speed, and total cloud cover. You can quite neatly see that they actually went up over those decades. If you take a long-term trend, you can see they got better and better. Um, there's two things which I think you should notice on this picture. Um, one is variables don't improve at the same speed. Um, that simply has to do with science. We always don't understand everything at the same speed. We don't always focus on everything at the same intense. And therefore, sometimes some variables take quicker improvement in certain, certain times than others do. And the other thing you can also see that variables don't improve very linearly. There's always step changes quite often in there. And there could be step changes due to resolution, but also just simply to physical understanding of the model. Um, so improvement of weather forecast is not a uniform thing. If I tell you now the weather forecast has become much, much better, that's true, but that's different for different variables. Um, on, the, on the bottom right, I've actually have done, um, I've tried to simulate a very similar plot um, in showing you the improvements over the last 10 years um, for precipitation, for, for discharge forecast over Europe. I've brought in the presentation just for, for knowledge. If you, if you concentrate on the dotted line, rather than on the high flow and low flow thresholds, so on the 50% um, flow threshold, um, and I've plotted it against lead times. So how many days over the last 10 years did a discharge forecast improve, not just through methodology, but also um, through hydrological better understanding? You can see that the line is above zero for all of them. Um, there seems to be more improvement to the end, which simply has to do that improvements tend to accumulate in a, in a slow varying variable such as discharge. Um, and you can see that we sort of outperform the average for precipitation, which is roughly 1.3 days um, over the last 10 years um, from lead time six onwards. So this improvement in forecasting is not just a meteorology thing. Um, and if you really take an Earth system approach seriously, um, it also means you improve hydrological forecasting. So it's very clear that hydrological forecasting, meteorological forecasting has significantly um, improved over the last year. However, um, I think we also have huge problems. Um, and I'm picking here particular on a hydrological problem. Um, this has been published by a colleague of mine 
And the, the question was really, how, how well do operational numerical weather predictions configurations represent hydrology? I talked a lot about earth system modeling and I talked a lot about um, how that improves and how we get it. So how do these earth system models represent hydrology? And they of course can see deficits. Um, and this paper, for example, in particular looked at um, peak river flow. Um, and we looked at how good or how bad is the water budget? And what you have here in the colored line is basically um, the error in the snow and soil water content um, of our land surface model. Um, and red basically means um, that the atmospheric or the land surface or the earth system modeling has to remove water from the land surface and blue means that it has to add water to the land surface. So you could ask now, why does it add or remove water? Well, the, the, the answer is fairly simplistic, is that, that adding and removing water changes the energy balance. And you're sort of trying to use that mechanism in order to improve better the initial state of the atmosphere and matching it up with temperature um, and dew point temperatures and radiation feedbacks. Um, but what it basically shows you is that in the snow dominated areas, um, Northern Europe, um, Northern Asia, um, the model has to remove waters. So we are very bad in actually modeling the snow bar, no snowpack itself. So we have huge deficits in actually representing um, snow melt or snow dominated areas um, in our land surface scheme. So what to do about it? Of course, we can now just go ahead and just try to improve the land surface one by one. Um, but we need to think differently. We need to think a different different mindset on how we actually do a forecast. And I'm gonna take you on a small excursion, probably a, a, a um, slight deviation. Um, some of you may, may, may know Minecraft. I hope for a lot of you have played it or play it. I don't know. Um, my kids play it a lot. Um, and the question is how can we be more bold and ambitious in trying to forecast a model? And if you have played Minecraft, you know there's different mods and you know these mods interact actually with the game. Now imagine if, if the forecast of the European Weather Center would be more like a Minecraft game. Imagine it would be an earth system where you can change the hydrological model yourself, where you can plug in your hydrological model and see what happens to the atmosphere, where the Minecraft mod is actually an earth system mod, where the Minecraft mod is actually something where you can add and remove processes and it still can run the entire system and interact with the system, where you can play and and pluck and see what happens, where you can simulate policies, water extractions of fires, um, and one person suggested to add aliens, not sure what to do to the weather system, um, but where you can really do changes. If you use such an earth system mod approach, um, you can actually go quite a bit. You can actually test and play with the system much, much further. You can actually develop the system much faster. You can actually harvest the intelligence of the entire world in trying to plug and play um, within that. There's a problem. There's a very, very fundamental problem. And the fundamental problem is um, that doing that requires more and more computer power. And I'm using here a very simplistic sample. Today, our ensemble forecasting system is run at 18 kilometers. That's 80 kilometer resolution. Um, we run it on now 91 levels. That's 91 levels going up in the atmosphere. Um, that makes roughly 151 million predicting points in the, in the, um, on the Earth. Um, if you go to nine kilometers, which here it still says 2020, that may not be 21 or 22 to be fair, um, we would have suddenly 904 million points which we're predicting. Even though the strategy is that we're going to forecast the Earth system or the entire Earth in a five kilometer resolution in 2025, um, that's 3.24 million predicting points. Um, you can already see there's a problem because nowadays ESMWF runs one of the largest supercomputers in the world or large supercomputers for weather forecasting in that sense, not in the world. Um, and um, we are already at the limit of what we have capability. And that's not our only problem. Our only problem is also that number of observation increases. So today we have roughly 40 million observations, 98% from different satellites, um, tomorrow, we're going to have roughly 100 to 200 million observations um, from 80 different satellite elements. I already said the number of grid points will massively increase. 
but also all of the other parameters in the sub be massively increased. So observations input will increase by a factor of five, or model input will increase by a factor of a thousand. Um, so that's a real challenge. And that challenge to answer is actually one of our biggest challenges at ESM that we have to call it the scalability program, where we're trying to fit onto a new computer. So that's sort of the challenge of trying to actually run and operate an operator forecast system. Um, and I think the last slide is trying to actually provide a sobering slide five minutes ago, a sobering slide of where science stands and actually influencing and improving forecasts. Science is an important point and what you do and what you study and what you learn in your hydrology course is extremely important to improve the science. However, it doesn't necessarily always influence what a forecast system design is. It doesn't always influence how a forecast looks like. What resolution do I do? How often do I run it? Um, there's many, many other factors. Science is important in terms of data simulation, in terms of observation processing, in terms of model complexity, in terms of horizontal resolutions, in the types of observations we're using, in the times of how we measure performance or how we present uncertainties, how many ensemble members. However, forecast is also influenced how it is used. What types of products do we have generated? How much time does it take to produce a product? It's important how long does it take to run a forecast? I may have developed the most perfect scientific model. If it takes 10 hours to run to do a five hour forecast, that's pointless. It's not a forecast anymore. It's gonna be done by the time that the, the, the forecast is over. How often do I, does I want to use a half a forecast? How often can a user deal with a forecast being updated? Let's assume you get one brilliant paper a year. Can a user deal with a new forecasting system every single year? Is it able to actually digest all those data. Um, that's sort of the cost of changing and adapting. Um, that's the user perspective. On top of that, you have the technical perspective. Your HPC has a maximum capacity. There's a peak time and this thing is full and there's no more you can put on it. Um, you can't run all the signs at the same time. Some of you have to stagger the sign and sometimes you have to make it simpler because it simply doesn't run. Um, there's also total capacity um, there's something called size of an electrical group. A supercomputer has a certain configuration in order to pass messages between itself. Um, it matters how they are connected. Um, that's sort of the size of electrical group. It matters how, how much you can store, how quickly you can store. It matters how much you can disseminate. It matters how close the data are to the computing. Um, so those are all the factors which are sort of really relevant for influencing forecast system design. On top of that comes first month costs, opportunity costs, communication, and then Conway's law, which I encourage you to Google if you don't know what that is. So what does this mean for you personally? What does this mean for you in the course? Um, it means that you need new skills, that science are an important part, um, but if you want to do research to operations, you can't just do research. You need to be able to analyze and visualize big data, and big data, I do mean big data, I don't just mean um, an Excel spreadsheet. You need to be able to run your software and mixed architectures. You need to be able to understand what's the difference between a GPU, CPU, and how do you have to program differently. Um, you need to understand what a cloud is and what a cloud-based infrastructure is, what it can and cannot do for your scientific use, for your scientific code. Um, the good news is a lot of, done, of that is already done already. Um, you're going to see something like the rise of domain-specific languages. Um, which hopefully takes some of the burden away of running a mixed architecture, so GPU and CPU one. Um, running parallel code is easier and easier. Visualization software um, is nowadays often designed to take account of many of the issues of big data. Um, but if you're at the, at the cutting edge of your research, there always will be hiccups. Um, one of the examples is to try to simulate a one kilometer global map. So what I've tried to do in my talk is take you from the beginnings of ESMWF and the types of things our organization produces in order to produce forecasts and the importance of uncertainty and ensemble forecasts and all the research and observations which go in there to the challenge to make your research matter, to make your research impact forecasting, to make your research something which influences other people's life. And that concludes my presentation nearly perfectly on time. Thank you.
dear Dr. Pappenberger, not only perfect on time, but perfect on content and the way you're presenting. Thank you very much and for these great visuals. Um, right, now we have to move to questions. So we have a number of questions collected. Let me move to that page with questions. Uh, actually, not that many, as I expected. So, um, uh, Berk uh, Duruturk uh, from Turkey originally, but he is now PhD student uh, at St. Petersburg State University. Question reads as follows. Dr. Pappenberger, what are your predictions of buoyant observation stations concerning uh, lack of them in the Arctic? Will it be possible to observe an increase of these stations? Thank you for the presentation. A uh, very good question, because you do know that, that um, there is a big lack of observations. And I think even um, um, to a larger extent, there's a problem of um, exploiting existing observations in the polar regions. And WMO has, for a good reason, or the World Meteorological Organization, for good reason, a program called the Polar Prediction, um, for which you can also download data these these websites. Um, will we see an increase of those boys? Um, I don't know. Um, I think one of the real difficulties is that many agencies across the globe struggle with funding. Um, and you have seen that, for example, um, there, was a, uh, there was an attempt to reduce the number of radio sound launches in Russia not that long ago um, due to budgetary reasons. And luckily, um, we could prove that this would be detrimental to the forecasts globally, and that decision was reversed. So will we see an increase of, of boy observation? I hope so. I really do. Um, on the other hand, I think there's big room to exploit existing observations considerably better to improve the forecasts. And on top of that, um, for polar regions, I think there's still a lot of research to be done because we haven't really understood all the processes, processes which actually matter in that region yet. All right, uh, thank you very much. Indeed, uh, the problem of uh, reduction of uh, uh, data networks during the last 30 years is really striking. And of course, governments say, well, we spend billions on launching satellites, so use them. But of course, uh, Earth data is, uh, or ocean data in this case is needed. Okay, uh, we move to the next question from Dr. Maredo from Institute for Water Problems of Russian Academy of Sciences. Dr. Pappenberger, you haven't mentioned it explicitly in your presentation, but what is your opinion on improving hydrological forecast communication to the general public? For example, for urban flooding, or can we keep it as simple as precipitation forecasts? Um, so I have to, I have to, I have to do one thing here. So my, 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 my disclaimer is I'm working for an institute which communicates to experts. So ECMWF is not in the business of communicating to end users um, as such. Um, however, I think your question is a very valid one. No, it's not just precipitation. I think it's far more complicated than that. And I think if we really truly want to sort of communicate flood risk in urban areas, we have a long way to go. I don't think we are, we are very often very skillful. However, there is very good examples across the globe showing that it actually works. Um, we have some citizen science projects which are quite encouraging in at least raising awareness for flood risk, which I'm aware is not the same as flood forecasting, but at least start to raise awareness um, of what happens. And um, I think particularly if you look, for example, at some of the papers from the University of Hull, where they are doing simulations of, of city um, in a virtual reality world and flash floods and flooding in cities, um, are really encouraging improving communication. I'm not a communication expert. Um, I still think we've got lots to learn. Um, there's one thing which is really sad is that of course, most of the global weather models actually don't contain cities. They don't actually contain urban areas. Um, so they don't neither model the runoff of these urban areas nor the, nor the, um, the heat island or the radiative feedbacks um, to the atmosphere. Um, so you could argue communication is a big thing but even in science, we haven't actually cracked it properly yet. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pappenberger. Indeed, maybe the models look into the future when we wouldn't have any cities because all evil comes from the cities, as we know. Right. Uh, by the way, Florian, could you maybe click a stop uh, sharing button on 
uh, Zoom so that I just realized I see you, but others don't. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Uh, we move to next question, uh, which is, uh, uh, what is it now? Yes. It is from uh, Nikolai Yusinsky from uh, uh, Russia. Dr. Papenberger, where do you think uh, lies an accuracy border of online parameters of ECMW model for Russia? We compared soil temperature and humidity with stations and the latter's error was much greater. Latter, I suppose, humidity. Yes, I'm pretty sure that humidity will have a bigger error. I've got a bit of a problem. Um, so there's, there's, there's always two parts of this question. There's, the, there's one part of the question is where does our current limits of predictability lie in terms of what the errors are? And I have to admit, I don't know exactly all Russia. Um, I probably can give you a larger picture in saying that humidity is far more difficult to forecast than soil moisture, um, but we know that this is very local very often. Um, and then that's the second, second point. Is there a limit of predictability? Is there a point where we can't predict beyond? And there I have to say in the past, it has been so often forecasted and postulated that we've reached a limit of predictability. You can do maximum five days, maximum 10 days. Um, and always was wrong. Um, so history has always proven that our predictions of predictions were incorrect. So let's just stop that business and assume we can go much further than we assume. Um, if you want to look at, um, I'm really sorry, I forgot the name. Um, if you want to look at the forecast performance over Russia, particularly for humidity and soil moisture, there's actually maps on our website showing verification results. If they're not here today, um, they're gonna be here in about um, 10 days because then we're gonna open all of our maps to be free and open. Um, and you're gonna see exactly error plots of this area. And you see error plots off the globe and you can also zoom into different geographic regions. I'm really sorry, I can't recall the performance of each single variable. Right, thank you very much. Uh, next question comes from uh, Franz, uh, Dr. Mark Ehrlich. Uh, Dr. Pappenberger, Given limited knowledge of the prediction of atmospheric turbulence in real time, is data simulation capacity and increase of computational power the only way of improvement of weather forecasting precision? No, very short answer. I think you sort of probably were expecting that because your question is slightly loaded. Um, data simulation is important. Observations are important. Um, but they're not all of it. And if you look very carefully at studies which were done with ECMWF, you can, you can roughly attribute 50% of the forecast skill to assimilation and to observations and 50% to model improvements um, in the medium range, that, that's said. That does not that does not valid for all the time ranges. Um, so no, there's actually a far bigger, far bigger um, domain of importance. And I think that also then sort of illustrates that computer and observations are not necessarily the key ingredients to produce a good forecast of any anything. You actually need good brains and good people which are well educated and understand the systems themselves. So you need humans who are clever enough to do so. All right, thank you very much. So still uh, physics uh, rules uh, to a large extent. Next question uh, from Ivan Varabevsky. Uh, Dr. Pappenberger, can you please say a few words about predictability performance of ECMWF in comparison to, for example, DWD in terms of convective precipitation events? God, now the questions get really specific. Um, okay, one has to be a bit, little bit careful because, of course, the German Weather Service is running, a, is running not just one model, it also runs a high-resolution model um, and we do very well know that ECMWF with this nine kilometers doesn't necessarily um, resolve convection, actually is able to predict convection properly. So there's still significant room for limited area models. So limited area models um, are thought and tend to be on average better in convective precipitation scenarios. Um, and therefore the model I've shown or the comparison I've shown was for the global German weather service model, which is not equivalent to a limited area model which is also run over the European and the German domain, which will do considerably better in convective cases. Thank you very much. 
and uh, I have here the question of uh, uh, Professor Gelfan. Uh, by the way, I forgot to say he is also present uh, in Zoom, and he is co-chair of the school and director of the Institute for uh, Water Problems. So shall I read out this question, which uh, question moderators uh, uh, um, uh, collected, or you could pose it yourself, Professor Gelfan? Yes, if you unmute, perhaps. It's up to you, Dmitry. Yeah, okay. So I will, uh, it's actually refers to question of Dr. Ehrlich, and it reads as follows. Can one say that the problem of the meteorological forecast improvement is mostly technological, model resolution, computer architecture, then scientific, physics of turbulence, parameterization, and so on. And this is a big question, which actually is posed by quite a number of our students at IHE Delft uh, about this. So. I think it's an excellent question. And I'm gonna answer it slightly differentiated now. Um, I think we are currently hitting a technology barrier, um, meaning um, we have written code for the last 30 years, largely on architectures where the CPU core became faster and faster. Um, and now we are moving into a new world um, where we actually have the type of GPUs where we not necessarily have faster, but we have more of them. Um, and I think our modern codes currently are not adapted to that. We actually need to rewrite a lot and, and, and change a lot. Um, that's what I sort of try to ex explain to scalability. So in order to run a very high resolution one kilometer model nowadays, you do need to change the way you think and the time you code. So there's a huge technology challenge there. Um, which is sort of broaden ourselves because we are a bit slow and we are still running Forge on something um, and have coded like this all the time. Um, however, I think one has to be careful to dismiss signs a bit too quickly here um, because the large progress does not come just through technology. It actually comes through advancing science knowledge of certain processes. And I think the polar prediction is actually a very good example of that, which I mentioned before, is that um, not only don't we use the observations properly, and that's not just a technology question, that's a science question, how we use these type of observations. How do we, how do we deal with um, um, open sky and, and all those different type of scenarios and trying to assimilate them? That's a pure science question, not just a technology question, but also how do we understand the processes in the polar region? How do we represent them in a model? Science is not just about understanding a process, it's also about how do I translate this process into a computing code or the computer code and make it actually work? How do I make it representative of what I actually the physics is? Um, so I think um, there has been, um, the reason why I think it's a good question is because there has been very often the comment that um, we sort of know everything and now we just need to implement it and it gets better. And I think that's, that's a very simplistic world view undervaluing a lot of the science which is actually happening. So it's neither yes nor no to your question, but I don't think it's just one. Thank you. Could you comment, uh, Professor Gelfan, on this? Uh, no comment, thank you very much. I, I fully agree with you. <laughs> so atmospheric physics is still uh, has enough to do. Yes. Uh, to improve uh, your models. But interesting, you're mentioning GPUs, so you have to rewrite codes to uh, to use the full potential of GPUs? You have to rewrite codes, um, but right. it's not just the code of the model itself, it's all the auxiliary of it too. Um, mm. The model itself is actually a very small part of everything. You also have things like how do you transform data, indigest data, how do you output data, um, how is the writing of the data. Um, and that's where um, I think those domain specific, so currently supercomputers, we just bought a new one, which is still based on the current CPU technology. It's very certain that the computers in about five years or the type we are buying will be more GPU based. So we will have to considerably rewrite code and all this stuff around it. Um, and that's a big job for a code which has right. been grown since the nineties and just added to. Uh, may I uh, conclude with the, my own question, uh, and maybe it would be interesting to our listeners from different countries. So to what extent uh, uh, experts uh, in different countries can use the forecasts of ECMWF? I, we know some of them are free and some are not. Could you comment on this briefly? 
Yes, um, so there's two aspects for this, a commercial and a research aspect. Actually, most of the data which most people will require for research are in something called the TIGI archive and freely accessible. Um, that's for research purposes. Um, then ESMW has a mixed model in the sense that all data which we call archive data are free, uh, are open, not necessarily free, but they're open and can be redistributed and available fairly easily, always for research anyway. Um, and then the real-time forecasts are, um, are sold under commercial licenses um, for forecasters. However, um, the one thing I really would like to encourage you, if you are working in a research domain, and it is purely research, and you're doing something like observation campaigns and measurement campaigns, ESMW will always support you with free forecasts to do your work and to enable you to do your research. Um, so if you have a specific problem, before you go down the route of looking what it actually costs, so you can't use the TIGI archive, it's always just ask. Um, we are very open and we really would like to, to foster research as much as we can, but we do have a commercial entity which sells our forecasts. Right, on this very positive note, uh, uh, and also uh, I would like to come to, I think we're coming to an end. I would I like also personally to thank you for showing the picture of Soviet spacecraft landing on moon, uh, which happened indeed, but there were no people on it. So my father actually built uh, this uh, space station, which was landing on moon in 1965 and 1969 and brought piece of uh, moon soil uh, back to earth. Unfortunately, it was a fantastic achievement. Come yes, on, let's go yes. Back there. Unfortunately, it happened just several days after Apollo 11 brought 50 kilos of soil back to Earth. But fine, that space race maybe is resuming now. Anyway, on this positive note about free access to codes, uh, sorry, not to codes, to the data and forecasts, I would like to thank wonderful uh, Florian Pappenberger for his presentation. Thank you for finding time during these difficult times. Uh, COVID uh, and and we very much hope uh, to see each other and uh, also audience uh, in Moscow if next year we'll be able to organize uh, this type of school. Thank you very audience, much. Audience, thank you very much. Pleasure. We convene again. Uh, when do we convene? Uh, let me not make mistakes uh, here. So we convene again uh, at 5.30 Moscow time. It's 16.30 Central European summer time for the lecture of Professor Jeffrey McDonnell of Canada. Colleagues, thank you very much. We have 15 minute break.